Hi, um, this is Bartek, I'm Fabian, and we kind of paired up over the last two and a half months um, and built a little project called Thanos. Um, this work has been sponsored by Improbable, a great company, they're here in London, um, and they're probably hiring. They're hiring. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what is Thanos? Thanos is a global, durable Prometheus monitoring solution. Um, and what that means is it's uh, strictly built on top of Prometheus 2.0, which was released in November, and we started working on Thanos shortly after. Um, and we, if you've used Prometheus, you know that has this really like sim Whoa. simple um, operational model, which makes it like really reliable because you have these isolated Prometheus deployments and nothing can go wrong across the network really except for paired data retrievals, basically. Um, which is great, and it has a really good data model and a query language. Um, but over time, you might sort of re realize there are some um, operational hurdles to actually make it scale across the globe, even. Um, so yeah, that's why we built Zenoth, and it's to we sort of have a, a notice on this. It's not integrating with the remote APIs you might have heard of. Um, that's for like reliability and performance reasons we sort of figured are important. Um, but it still sits entirely on top of Prometheus, and it's completely seamlessly integratable into any existing deployment without any configuration changes. And with that, I hand off to Bartek, who will tell you about sort of the shortcomings they experienced at Improbable. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, so basically, as Fabian said, single Prometheus server is extremely powerful. Uh, but at some point, you need to scale out these servers and run multiple Prometheus server, servers uh, at scale. Uh, so how to do it? How, like, is it difficult or not? So let's take an example uh, from the Improbable uh, infrastructure. So basically, we are running lots of uh, services at the global scale distributed over multiple isolated Kubernetes clusters. Obviously, it is kind of more complicated than that, but we can simplify to this uh, uh, to actually show uh, our monitoring stack. Uh, we do functional sharding, so we kind of, uh, we are placing single Prometheus server per uh, single cluster, and well, we can we, we cannot do it uh, otherwise because uh, in any alternative way because all these clusters are isolated, so uh, there is no way around it. Uh, at the top, we are accessing all of this data using uh, like dashboard engine for consistent view and some other aggregator that uh, helps out uh, helps out like aggregating all of these hours for uh, from the leaf Prometheus servers. Um, and this is great, like this mostly works uh, when you're careful, but uh, is there anything missing? Is there any problem with that? So actually, uh, first of the main problem we, we have seen is that we really want a global view. Global view is like a, a way to, to, to have, uh, to query uh, the data that uh, came from different sources, different Prometheus servers. Uh, so one of use cases of it would be to uh, have an alert that will trigger when most of the cluster in the region is down. Uh, how to do it? Having multiple Prometheus servers? Uh, well, basically, we, uh, we can add one global me meta Prometheus server that will uh, use KRKR Federation, which is for a long time available in Prometheus. And this is how we do it, uh, and basically, we scrape all of the leaf Prometheus servers, but we scrape only por portion of the data. It's not like the, uh, we scrape everything because that's not possible. We cannot feed the data there. So they are federated and we are using like uh, really weird like uh, metric name matching uh, and only this going up and mostly these are rules. Uh, so yeah, there are obvious problems with that. Like it is still single point of failure. Uh, we uh, yeah, it creates troubles with maintenance because of the configuration and all the all the rules and and kind of this this uh, name matching level matching that goes only to the federated one, and yeah, the most important bit is like what things are actually federated. It's kind of ambiguous. Like uh, and and to add a new thing, you need to really uh, update uh, like Prometheus's and and it's really really hard and also also it's it is not pure global view because you have only portion of the data and ideally we would like to have all of it. Okay, let's move to the availability. So so we are really serious about that at Improbable. So we really care about uh, every minute uh, of the data. So we, we don't want to lose that. We want uh, 
any Prometheus to be 100% available for, for the targets to have this data available. Uh, so with our current solution, like all sorts of things can go wrong. You can have an operator error, error so simply like someone misconfigure the server and push that to the to, the, to prod. Uh, yeah, your your uh, server or disk can do, can go down, or even rollout is disruptive because uh, if you cannot, if you are not able to uh, restart the pod, uh, like within the scrape interval, well, you are losing the samples, right? Uh, and and there's no easy way for doing like rolling restarts that makes sense in kind of with stateful set and then Prometheus. This is really hard to actually avoid. Again, how we how we can assure that uh, without Thanos uh, in a current kind kind of way at Improbable. So why not adding like another Prometheus for HA? Why not do that? Uh, we obviously have some redundancy, but there are higher chances that no data will be will be lost, and we can do kind of rolling restart because, well, there will be something there. Uh, all of these will scrape obviously the same targets. Uh, well, yeah, it's still problematic, right? Because it's not really uh, easy to tell from which one you should scrape, you should you should query, uh, which one you should query, uh, like. It's, you can mitigate that, work around that, but it's really hard to tell who is the source of the truth for your metrics. Uh, obviously, cost you like redundancy for your know, local disk or resources. Yeah, it's it's kind of waste maybe. Uh, and obviously, yeah, you have local alerts and local rules, and it's it's not easy how to like duplicate these these things. Like still possible, but really really hard. And the last thing that that we thought, we think that is really really important is like how far I can go back with my metrics. So basically, there are lots of use cases. Uh, yeah, maybe you want to go uh, like in certain time somewhere to see some bits what that were happening. Maybe you want to compare like current like arbitrary metric value with with something uh, like two years ago or some or something, or like like the I think that the most universal thing, like long-term characteristic of the, let's say, user traffic for your service. All of these are super valid cases, and we really want that at Improbable. Uh, but our kind of current infrastructure, I can have only nine days. This is this is not great, um, and it's not because like Prometheus can handle can, cannot handle uh, more as it is. It's just our configuration and our like amount of the data is like too much, but how without without Thanos, how we can improve that right now? How we can have uh, longer retention? Well, first of all, we need to upgrade to Prometheus too. At in infrastructure, we are using still 1.8, uh, but we are right about to move. Uh, so basically, thanks of the hard work from the Prometheus community, we have a total number of series uh, uh, for the local storage or local Prometheus uh, is no longer impacting the performance of the Prometheus itself. So like query and, and scraping and startup for sure. So in kind of in theory, we could just like increase the disk, right? Uh, and grow it more and more and throw everything like whatever. So to have like one year data retention. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it has its it limits. Like there are problems like how do, how would you do that? the backup of that, how you maintain that. Let's say you want to grow up the disk even more, then you need to resync everything. Like it is it is really, really hard. Obviously cost, like if you are throwing more SSDs at that and we, you have like one year old data, do you really want SSD for that? Like it is not used so often. So, well, we, we don't do it. Like it, it, we, and we are stick to nine days. So yeah, to sum up, we, we currently have this kind of problems and kind of desires to, to have a global view, a proper one, uh, be more reliable, and first, yeah, that the most important thing is like increase retention. So yeah, that's why we came up with Thanos, uh, which is open source from the very, very beginning. Uh, so we can look it after the presentation. And yeah, uh, this uh, project was mainly, mainly uh, are meant to address these main goals, 
but also uh, we want to make sure it is seamlessly, uh, I mean, it is seamless to integrate with the current Prometheus, like, and that you can do it step by step, like not entirely replacing uh, your existing stuff with, with, with something else. Uh, so yeah, additionally, like we need to like easy operation model again, and yeah, like as le as a small amount of dependencies and and baseline really are uh, to make sure that uh, small uh, small scale can run the tunnels just fine in the same way as as large scale setups like we have. So how we actually make the global view happen uh, with tunnels? So basically, we take the vanilla Prometheus, same con like similar configuration, uh, maybe a little bit shorter, uh, short retention, but like it's totally the same. We just add uh, one container, like one binary, next to it in the same pot, let's say, uh, which is like a com uh, Thanos component, first Thanos component called Sidecar, and first of the use case of it is. Uh, is that 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 it exposes a certain API, which is called Store API. It's pure GFC, and it maps the request uh, and just proxies uh, pro proxies it to the Prometheus itself using remote read. And this is how the API looks. Why it's why it is important. Uh, so basically, we want to make sure that this API is consist consistent with like every other uh, Thanos component, which is really important. And also, we want to, uh, well, have we want to have some uh, flexibility to adjust this API a little bit for Thanos purposes. So basically, you have th three methods, but the main one is series. So you get, uh, yeah, some series set, actually stream of series set, series, uh, and that contains some chunks uh, with encoded samples, uh, and you do that based on the time range and blah blah matching. Thanks on that, we can put a querier, so which is another uh, com uh, Thanos component, and this guy is able to fetch the data through the store API, API uh, and it like does the PromQL evaluation and expose the standard query API, so it's compatible with any, anything you put on top of your Prometheus, because it's the same API, so you can use your Grafana things, uh, engines, you, you can use uh, yeah, PromUI, just fine. But what it makes yeah, even more cooler is that you can actually find out, query is able to find out the request to the like multiple Prometheus sidecars, actually. Uh, and with just small addition of, of the merging stage, we are able to present that as a single kind of series set, as, as a single query view. And this basically fixes the, the global view problem because you are now able to present that as a single query, within a single query. Uh, but there is more about it. Uh, so basically, you can do HA as well uh, and, and, and do it transparent, transparently for the user. So basically, with some another, another deduplication stage, uh, we can query uh, yeah, the same uh, Prometheus servers, I mean, two Prometheus servers that are scraping the same targets and they have like totally same data actually and uh, present that to the user as a single thing. So, uh, and yeah, thanks to that you can, you can reliably, more reliably store the data. And yeah, this, uh, one more thing uh, about it. So basically at that point, you can run all of it uh, uh, without any additional stuff. So basically, uh, this already fixes yeah some some kind of global view and availability. Uh, so you can just grab it at that point and run it just uh, with to fix you, these use cases. Uh, but uh, actually, ta uh, Fabian is going to uh, talk more about how we you can also. The, the last thing, which is long retention. Okay, yeah, as Patek said, this is like all bonus. You can just deploy the query uh, stuff uh, by itself and it will just work. Um, and then you can just plug in everything that comes now on top of this, which is really cool. Um, so first we take a step back kind of and look at how the Prometheus uh, storage engine as of 2.0 actually stores data. 
Um, and it does so by having blocks which are assigned to a fixed time range. Um, and these blocks basically contain everything we need to sort of uh, access data that was collected in this time range. So these are kind of, every block is kind of a standalone database. Um, and it's also immutable. So once it's written by Prometheus, it gets never modified again, which is really good. Um, because, um, oh, let's first look into this. So what's actually in one block? It's basically just a directory with a bunch of files. Um, and it's chunk files, which contain compressed time series data and an index file which basically allows you to look up certain series and then points into these chunk files and tells you where what data is. Um, so it's pretty simple. These files are at the order of um, half a gigabyte per chunk file and the index file varies from a few hundred megabytes to a few gigabytes. Um, it's all really simple. And we're actually gonna use this um, to now build sort of actual long-term storage on top of all of this. So um, first of all, we have to back up data in some way, right? Um, and we can just use the sidecar again because the sidecar is sitting next to a Prometheus server and your Prometheus server generates data. So every like two hours approximately, it will spit out a new block and we can just watch the disk and say, oh, there's something new. And as soon as we see it, we just upload it to object storage. Um, object storage is Thanos only dependency if you want to use long-term storage. Um, and we picked it because it's a cheap and it's also always available. So everybody who has a cloud has some sort of a cloud provider who offers some object storage, be it S3 or TCS. Um, if you have an on-prem solution, you're most likely running HDFS in some way, which also supports the standard object storage APIs. Uh, so this is basically available everywhere, not a hard dependency to fulfill for anybody, which is really good. Um, yeah, and it's really dirt cheap. Like you can store tons of data and you can't really go cheaper. Um, yeah, and then we just upload all these blocks and their files as soon as we see them. Um, and then we have a working backup solution. That's a good start, I say. Oh yeah, and what's really cool about this is that this is not bound to real-time sort of um, transfer of data, which is the problem we saw with the remote write API because it sort of streams out data in real-time. And it has like a small in-memory buffer, but this cannot really go very far with like a high throughput Prometheus server. Um, so if you have like network issues with the object storage for like a few minutes, you're gonna lose data and you cannot really restore it well. Um, and with these blocks, you have sort of a local cache, however big you like, you can make this like your full retention of like weeks or maybe just like 24 hours like we do. Um, and basically, if you have a network outage um, after like 24 hours, it will just like, the link is restored and we just like sort of backfill everything you've collected since then um, and you don't lose data. And that's actually something that happened very early on. We had a misconfiguration and couldn't reach the bucket. Um, yeah, and we didn't even notice because it's, it's, it's really fault sort of in this regard. So how do we query it again? Uh, first of all, of course, the store node is obviously implementing our nice store API. Um, so for the query layer, it appears just like a sidecar or really anything that can provide data in some way uh, to the query. So we have, don't have to distinguish in any way for the query um, of what, or what the store node is. And now we just need the store node to basically act as a gateway to your object storage and um, to expose all this data that's in there um, via this API. Um, now the problem is of course that object storage is really, really slow. Um, at least that's like sort of a common understanding. Uh, so it's not really suitable as a database, I suppose. Um, but actually, we had some ideas to sort of work against this fact. Uh, so what are the options? Uh, I mean, A, we could just, if you get a query, download the entire chunk and index files for blocks we want to actually hit. Um, that's okay, but it's kind of slow. Uh, it's actually really, really slow. Uh, it would kind of work for like, could sort of have queries as batch jobs. Um, but it would certainly not scale really well. Um, of course, you can also cache it locally, um, but of course, at some point, your cache is gonna sort of uh, flow over and you have to drop data again, um, and it's probably not gonna be efficient in any way. So we thought about something else. Um, we look at the sort of inside of a chunk file in Prometheus, and what we have there is just a bunch of chunks. These are uh, 200 to 800 bytes, um, sort of blocks that com are contain compressed sample data for one series. Um, and it's about 120 samples each. So each series can have multiple chunks in these files. Uh, and we can just do a range request against the uh, object storage instead of like fetching the full file. So we can just fetch a certain range if we know where this range is, uh, which is good uh, because a lot faster. Uh, on DCS, for example, uh, we measured a bit and the 90th percentile moves at the area of like 20 milliseconds. That's really, really fast, um, especially because it's such a like, cheap storage. Um, yeah, if we sort of step through this, like how the boots work out, uh, we have 1,000 series um, at a 30 second scrub interval, and now let's scrub this for one year. Yeah, that's like 8.7 million chunks. 
it's not going to work. Um, I mean, you could try it, but it's like going to take a long, long time, and you're probably better off just downloading all the files. Um, so this is kind of a showstopper. But of course, Prometheus um, storage layer is designed in a somewhat sort of sane way, and it works against read amplification um, by co-locating data uh, in a proper way. So naturally, we just align chunks that belong to the same series sequentially in these files. So we can already fetch. Um, if a series has three chunks, we can just fetch these three chunks in one request, which reduces our request count, which is pretty good. Um, and then we also actually align similar series. Usually, or literally every query in Prometheus fetches some metric name. So if you align these, uh, all these series by their metric name in the, in the chunk files, you actually f can basically always satisfy a single query with one request um, per block. And this usually reduces the amount of requests you would have to do by four to six orders of magnitude, which means our 8.7 million requests are turned into something like 20 requests, um, which is well within bounds and actually really, really fast if you just fire these off in parallel. And of course, um, there is some sort of long tail um, latency in object storages, but this is usually still like well within bounds for what uh, expectation you have in recurve Prometheus. It's like a, it must be real time, but real time for like some ops person. Uh, it's not like we don't need like microsecond precision. So everything like below five, five milliseconds is probably okay. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the example of a chunk file. The index is a bit more complex, but it works in a similar way. So the format works against read amplification, and we can often do a lot of lookups um, by just sort of um, folding many requests into a single one. Uh, and for indices, we actually do some sort of local caching, um, but it's, it's really, really tiny. Uh, chunks are not cached at all, which means that there are no like hot and cold queries, which is really good, um, because you're not gonna have like queries that return in like 100 milliseconds and other ones that take like 20 seconds. So, uh, compaction, that's actually something that the Prometheus storage engine does. Um, but since we are shipping off these blocks as soon as we can to object storage now, uh, this doesn't really work anymore. We cannot wait for Prometheus to compact data into bigger blocks. Um, okay, maybe take a step back. Uh, compaction actually means that we take blocks for a small time range or multiple blocks for a small time range and compact them into a bigger time range, which then allows us again to align even more chunks um, in, a, in a way we have to do fewer reads and also reduces the index size. Um, so we have to have somehow handle this um, out of band and out in Prometheus, uh, which is why we sort of added this small compactor component, which you can run as a basic batch job. There's not, no magic to it. Um, and it would just start and look through your object storage for blocks we uploaded. Um, and if, find, if it finds blocks that can be compacted together, it will just download them, compact them, and just upload them and delete the old ones. It's pretty simple. Um, it just addresses this read amplification concern um, which is actually really important to keep this thing performant over time. So, um, yeah, that's increased retention. Um, so we have ticked off all of these three initial goals, uh, and it all works out really great. Um, yeah. So we kind of ran out of work um, and <laughs> figured we might do something else, um, which is downsampling. Um, that comes up with Prometheus quite often here and there. Um, it's kind of a strict non-goal upstream because, yeah, on the local Prometheus server, it's, it's really a big task. Um, and always the, the goal is kind of to keep this in some sort of long-term storage solution, which Thanos is, so we are going to handle it. And why do we handle it? Uh, well, initially we thought, yeah, it's not really necessary, right? Like, it's, it's returning so fast. Like, it can fetch, like, hundreds of megabytes of sample data and just return it in, like, a few hundred milliseconds, so there's really no reason for, uh, for downsampling. Um, and so, especially because our compression format for samples is so great. Um, and it is really great because it does like all these XO magic on the float 64 presentations of your sample data and it's really, really cool and compresses 16 bytes to 1.07 bytes, um, which also means it's kind of complex and it's also really slow because it takes 10 to 40 nanoseconds per sample, which seems okay enough, um, but if you actually Query 1000 series, again, over one year, that's over 1 billion samples, which means 10 to 40 seconds of just decoding or decompressing sample data. <laughs> that's a long, long time to wait. Um, and of course, it just gets worse as you query more series or query like 10 years of data. Um, and then you have to sort of pump all these samples through your actual query functions like rate, uh, which is also kind of expensive. So you can kind of expect this to be more like 80 seconds probably, or even longer. Uh, so downsampling is not so much a matter of data storage size, because that's really cheap. Also not of data retrieval, it's just actually processing concern. So um, we just went for two fixed downsampling um, 
resolutions, which is uh, five minutes and one hour. Um, and then we have the raw data. And we actually just keep all data around forever because it's really cheap. Uh, there's really no point in removing the raw data, um, especially because then we can always still access it, which is really nice. Uh, so how does downsampling work? Um, basically, we take a few chunks of raw data um, that cover a certain time range, um, and then we just aggregate them together. And the naive way would be we just take a certain um, window and just take all these samples, average them, and produce a new sample. Um, but that's going to look mostly OK. But um, for a lot of queries, it will just like return nonsense or certainly not accurate enough data. So we actually have to do something sort of more elaborate, which is we have to compute multiple aggregates per series. Um, and we sort of added this container chunk format, uh, which actually contains uh, a count, a sum, a min, and a max aggregation. And also, because Prometheus deals with these counter resets in a special way, uh, we needed an extra counter um, aggregate, which is kind of another kind of worms. Um, yeah, and of course, because we want to downsample five minute data, we also have to be able to downsample downsample chunks into downsample chunks. Uh, yeah, and then we basically just at query time dynamically pick which aggregate we need. So for count over time queries, we of course take the count aggregate. For sum over time queries, we're going to take the sum aggregate, um, and so on and so on. Um, and lastly, for rate and increase, we take the um, yeah the special counter thing. And the wildcard for everything else is average. Um, and we don't actually store it. We just sort of take the count at the sum aggregate and on the fly um, sort of merge them together, which is fine because the count is like, because the downsample data is like really, really consistent. Uh, the count aggregate is like really small and really cheap to decode. So we do not suffer from any like 2x um, slowdown in this case. Yeah, um, that's basically it. Um, and the downsampling process is actually going to be embedded in the compactor. Um, it's pretty new, um, but yeah, it will just be part of this uh, batch processing. Uh, so now our full architectures, architectures basically, we have uh, our Prometheus servers, which are virtually not touched configuration-wise. We just put the sidecar next to them. And the sidecar will upload and back up new data into your object storage bucket as soon as it appears. Um, and then it will sort of expose itself as a store API provider um, to the query layer, which is just this horizontally scalable layer. It's like really tiny. Um, and the store node is basically a gateway to the bucket data and also just exposes itself as a store API provider. And they're all interconnected um, via a gossip protocol. So it's sort of fault tolerant, especially because you're monitoring and even your service discovery might fail. So we don't necessarily want to rely on that. And with gossip, we, we have like a fault tolerant system um, and also don't sort of can propagate some metadata, which is um, uh, important for filtering sort of which nodes we actually hit um, via the gossip protocol instead of having basically n square request to fetch metadata from your peers. And the compactor just sort of sits there. And it's a batch of, it's, it's really, uh, not really part of the architecture, let's say. So, um, and yeah, it's really easy to deploy. So it's one command, like one binary with four commands. There's no configuration files. Um, it's just a small set of flags for each of these commands. And you just, yeah, point things to a bucket, point things to your cluster. Um, it's really easy to get started. So how do you deploy this at a global scale now? Um, because that's kind of a different thing again, right? Um, so you might have one logical or physical cluster somewhere, and you deploy um, all data that's sort of gathered there is uploaded to a certain bucket in this region, um, and you have your own query nodes, and that's all fine. So how do you connect actual like physical clusters uh, around the world? Um, so option A is if you don't have sort of any VPC kind of thing um, and don't want to span your gossip cluster around the globe, which certainly has um, some setup complications. Um, you can just sort of use a federation approach. And that's not Prometheus kind of fake federation. <laughs> it's it's like actual federation. Um, so that's actually an API, um, which means every query node um, exposes the store API as well. But it acts sort of as, a, as an intermediary or aggregator for its entire local cluster. So we can access all store APIs within this cluster by hitting the store API of the query node. And if you then interconnect all these query layers with each other, they can all, sort of for, for certain data that's affecting another region, just fan out to this other query node, which, which would then, again, fan out locally in its cluster and fetch the relevant data. And this, yeah, it's more of a static kind of configuration, which works fine because you probably don't spin up like clusters all day long. Um, and the alternative, of course, is you just actually take your gossip cluster around the world um, and literally just interconnect everything so every query and every cluster can hit any sidecar, any store node. Uh, in any other cluster, um, which is also really interesting. And um, so sort of, I'm just showing here like one query node because otherwise it would be like a lot of errors. 
Um, but this would actually still scale because of because we're using gossip to propagate m membership and meta information. So um, what does it cost? That's the interesting part uh, because we, we wanted it to be cost efficient as as far as we can. Um, and the store and query nodes kind of don't really count because the work you've previously been doing on Prometheus are now just shifted somewhere else. It's just like a one-on-one -on -one trade off. Um, so that's really not a cost factor in the end. But you probably need fewer SSDs because you can cut down your two months of retention on your local Prometheus servers to something like three or four days, whatever safety margin you want uh, in case a Prometheus server cannot upload data to the object storage. So that basically leaves you with a cost you have to pay for storing data in your bucket um, and the request you have to pay um, in and out of this bucket. Let's take an example. We have 20 Prometheus servers, which is a lot, um, each ingesting 100,000 samples a second. That's also a lot. That's probably more than most most people have, yeah. Um, and to store this data for like two months, we probably need like half a terabyte of disk space per Prometheus server. Um, and we're producing 250 gigabytes per server per month. Um, and if we add like 20% overhead for the downsample data, um, we will end up after one year with like 72 terabyte of data in our object storage. And that costs you like $1,440. That's pretty okay still. Um, and for the requests, say you have 100 requests per second to your bucket. Um, that's probably also like $100, and that's probably more than you actually have because the recent data will basically never hit the bucket because most of your queries are on recent data and these are served by the Prometheus servers themselves, so there's no cost involved in this case. So that's probably going to take you quite far, which means Thanos will cost at this scale $1,500 a month, which is pretty, pretty cheap. You probably have like way more spendings in other cases if you're this big, um, but actually we're saving money because we can reduce our SSD um, space from 500 to like 50 gigabytes, which means we're saving $1,530 a month um, on the regular Prometheus setup, which means you get all the benefits of Thanos, the global aggregation, the global view, the actual long-term storage downsampling uh, for $10 a month, like in, in the big picture. <laughs> so it's really cheap. Sure. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much.